department, and I've got the pleasure of moderating today's session. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm gonna have a short spiel to, to lead us off and then we'll get into, uh, into the meat of the presentation. Uh, so first, and we can maybe advance the slide, I wanna introduce the panelists that are gonna be chatting today. Uh, John Pridnia, who is the regional managing partner for our greater Michigan area, uh, and Tom Shemansky, who heads up our CFL outsourcing group, will be uh, taking uh, the first swings at all of the stimulus package updates in the new program. And then Tracy Marin, who heads up our tax consulting group, will be uh, diving deep into some of the important new tax aspects. Um, also with us is Shannon Hensel from our HR consulting group. She will be addressing things that, uh, that have come up either in questions pre-submitted or that may come up in the chat um, as we go along today. Uh, and again, looking at things from the HR perspective. Uh, <clears throat> to set the groundwork, um, a few comments about this act. Most of you have probably seen, it's been uh, widely reported, it's the largest law ever passed by the federal government. Uh, it's got a lot of things in it. Uh, if you happen to be squarely in its crosshairs, it's very powerful. Um, a lot of good stimulus package opportunities for you. Uh, but it is big and it is complex. And to remind you of where we stand in the process of rolling it out, the law has been passed and it is now to a variety of federal agencies and departments, including Treasury, the IRS, the Small Business Administration, and other groups to start to put together the policies and procedures by which the law will be enacted on a practical basis. Once those various folks get their work done, it will roll out to banks and other end users. As a reminder, uh, prior to the land of COVID, this usually happened over a fairly long period of time. Uh, there was a lot of time given for comments, uh, things were, were more deliberately contemplated, and uh, we expect this will be rolled out much like the Family First Act and the CARES Act, where it's going to come fast and furious. There will be a lot of noise in the marketplace, uh, and so our, our goal today is really to give an overview of what we know from the law, which of course, can be impacted ultimately by how these agencies or departments interpret the law. Uh, and also maybe warn us a little bit against some of the bad information uh, that, that is rolling around. We're already seeing, you know, what I, what I only can describe as, as predatory activities um, taking place where, where we have different vendors who are, are sending clients and prospects threats that the PPP round two is already already open for application and almost out of money. And if you don't apply from with us right now, you're not going to get in and um, different things involving employee retention credit and others. And so we just really wanna try to inject good information and some calm into the, the knowledge base here for everybody. And a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, this presentation will be out on the Raymond YouTube channel. If you go on YouTube and hit Raymond, this and other presentations like it are out there. So. You can fast forward past my part to the things you really want to listen to uh, and, and re-listen to and forward it on to other folks that you think may find value out of it. We really intend to have two presentations going on today. We'll have the live sessions, which are going to be focused around the, the cash stimulus side and the tax changes, but then we're also going to have uh, Q&A being answered uh, in the background. So we'll have the, the verbal and the written conversations going. So please pay a little attention to both. Uh, we received some 85 questions from the registration. Many of those will be answered during the sessions. Uh, many of those, the answer is we don't know yet because further guidance has to be uh, has to be rolled out before we can answer them. And some of the questions were really specific, and so we're not going to try to to delve into a specific situation online. But we'll have you teed up to to talk to your advisor or an advisor uh, offline. So you'll see some of that happening in the background. Feel free to ask questions. Um, anything that we don't get to, we've reserved a half hour after the presentations for us to, to have an open Q&A, kind of a round table session, where again, we just try to tell you what we can tell you for sure, the, the things that we know are issues that we don't know and, and the things that we're just waiting to hear on. 
Um, I suppose one last bit of, uh, of, of housekeeping. This is the overview session. There will be additional webinars coming up. There'll be one, at least one, focusing on the human resource aspects. Uh, there will be different niche uh, webinars, real estate and construction, manufacturing, um, I'm sure healthcare, uh, that come out that, that will address those particular nuances and niches. And of course, uh, more detailed cash slash PPP type webinars and tax webinars. So with that, I think I've covered my entire punch list. Um, again, we really appreciate everyone joining us and we're going to roll right over into what I call the, uh, the cash element, the stimulus package highlighted by PPP 2.0. So Mr. Shemansky and Mr. Pridnia, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Chip. Um, yeah, part two, uh, uh, we, we all went through part one and came out of that a little bit scarred, but um, uh, hopefully for the better. I think all of you as borrowers, I think there are a lot of borrowers in the audience. Uh, I hope that things, although they were changing almost daily, weekly as we were going through it, eventually we got there. Our hope is that this is going to be much more streamlined, much more effective, much more efficient, because we've always we've already been down that road already. But with 5,600 pages of uh, legislation, um, not all dealing with PPP matters, of course. Uh, there's always going to be FAQs. There's always going to be interpretations. There's got to be follow-up corrections. Um, so stay tuned. Um, and we did hear that a lot of the forms, at least in draft phases, might be might be out this week. So keep your eyes open for emails from us. We'll continue to monitor this progression and and feed you as much information as we can as soon as it's available. So with that, let's get into um, the generalities. The top, I'm gonna say it, it's my top 10 list of things that I pulled from uh, reading the, the sections in, in PPP, things that I think would be important. So we do know $284 million was appropriated to second wave of PPP. And there's a few of them that don't impact many, but they are important just the same. So I'll throw kind of everything in there as a, as a my top 10. So expanded eligibility, 501c6 organizations, a lot of chamber of commerce and um, those sorts of associations, trade organizations, uh, as long as they're not true lobbying firms are now gonna, now gonna be eligible for the PPP. It did provide a second draw if you've already got a first draw on the first round in 2020, they'll let you take another and it's capped at $2 million on these second loans. There are restrictions on these second rounds. You gotta have less than 300 employees and must prove a decrease of at least 25% quarterly revenue, that's quarter to quarter, 19 to 20. So first quarter to first quarter, second to second, et cetera. Um, and, and again, that's gonna be um, more guidance is going to come as far as what the forms are, but pretty much consider it's going to be the same thing. You're going to, you're going to have to support it based on these calculations and provide proof that it is there. Um, and it is going to be also the calculation two and a half times your monthly average wages, unless you get into and point number four, NAS, NAICS code 72, which is generally hospitality, restaurant businesses, that gives you an added 3.5 over the 2.5 of eligible payroll for your base loan period. Number five, they've provided flexible coverage period. So before it was either eight or 24, now it's eight or any time before the 24 week period is up. Um, provides you a little bit of flexibility for filing early. Expanded forgiveness costs. They added several items into those non-payroll qualifying costs. We always knew that that was like mortgage interest or uh, rent payments and some, um, some utilities, some of those sorts of things that were associated with business. Well, they added property damages for, from uh, public disturbances, uh, supplier costs, and, and most importantly, I think are the PPE costs. A lot of the medical businesses have had to spend an atrocious amount on their PPE cost uh, to keep up with, uh, with the regulations in the states um, around the country. So that will be also qualified. Again, remember it's still 60-40. You can only use 40% of these non-payroll qualifying costs in your calculation for forgiveness as it comes around. This is a big one, number seven, idle grants. We all understood that when we did our PPP1 that the idle loan was a reduction in the forgiveness amount. 
uh, when it, when you submitted your loan, let's say you had a two hundred thousand dollar loan, you you should have qualified for full forgiveness, but you got ten thousand dollars in an idle loan. Your maximum forgiveness was going to be four ninety. Now they say that that is no longer a reduction. And Tom's going to go into more detail on that about what we know and what that might look like. It's a big issue to not have to, to reduce that. And that's additional cash that comes into your pocket. You don't have to repay back. Simplified forgiveness. It was $75,000 loans up to 75,000 was a one page. I attest that we used it for the right reasons. It did all the right things. They've increased that. They've uh, increased it to $150,000. Again, with those similar attestation that we use the money the way we said we were going to. Bankruptcy, they provided some additional clarity in, in those companies that are going through insolvency, bankruptcy, restructuring um, that can still claim PPP money. Um, it's a different process. And Chip, who's our specialist in bankruptcy, would be happy to work with you on that if that's an issue that comes into play. And this bill, um, they said the SBA had to come back to uh, Congress within 10 days um, with stated guidance. Um, and this past uh, the 27th, I think, was, was when it came out. Um, so we're running close on those 10 days. That's why we think this week we'll start seeing some rollout of some of those forms. So stay tuned. Yeah, and a couple, couple quick things off of these slides. Yep. Um, the first one, the note on the bankruptcy side of things, uh, Biggest change is if you're subchapter five bankruptcy, you're eligible. Another big change though has to do with landlords and renters. And so if that's your uh, that's your your situation, there will be another webinar coming out in a bit uh, to chat about that. A couple quick questions just about the some of the things that you've you've put up. Um, the uh, the twenty five percent reduction is that a cash or accrual base? I don't believe they've they've actually defined that yet, Tom. You may I don't recall them putting it in there. It's been just quoted as twenty five percent reduction in gross receipts. But you can't go accrual to cash. I think it has to be consistent. That would make only sense that you're consistent with your record, your way of reporting. Yeah, apples to apples, and that's just one quarter, right? Not every quarter for twenty twenty. One one quarter out of the four has to be a twenty five percent reduction from nineteen to twenty, and then you qualify as long as you have less than three hundred employees. Great. Um, all right, those are the couple of things that came up, and I thought uh, should be should be nailed quick. So carry on. All right, we'll go to the next slide then. This I'm going to hand it over to Tom to give a little bit more detail about what it looks like and what it might look like as we move forward. Sure, thanks, Dan. And really, uh, just a couple other points to follow up, looking through some of the questions um, on some of these areas. Uh, you know, the second draw amount, as John mentioned, is capped at $2 million. Uh, but if you didn't apply the first time, you still have the, uh, the $8 million cap if you're a first time uh, company applying. So if you're on you know, sidelines for PPP1, now you've decided, hey, things have changed, I'm going to go in for the loan. Um, the, the, the 8 million is still a number that is available if you hadn't applied. The $2 million cap applies uh, only to those uh, businesses that uh, have fought, are filing for a second uh, alone. Uh, a couple other points. Uh, one is the, the, the simplified application. Uh, again, you know, not, not to be confused with auto forgiveness. Um, it is a simplified application, uh, two page document. But there is a record retention requirement. Um, in the, the latest revision, they've outlined uh, a three to four year period, depending on the type of document that you need to retain your records if the SBA were to come back and ask you uh, for something on your loan less than 150000 So you really need to walk through the forgiveness calculation process to be sure you can answer those questions and, and retain those records because it could be something that uh, could be reviewed. So it's not. Uh, it's not as simple as just signing the form, sending it in, and uh, and yeah, no no, no problem with uh, <clears throat> forgiveness. Um, again, John mentioned too that you know there there is the extended uh, forgiveness cost, uh, you know, some additional categories, uh, supplier payments, uh, more operational expenses. Uh, but I think you know you, you do have to keep in mind, like John said, the 60-40 split. So. You know, while you, there are more categories, it still has to maintain that 60% payroll number. Um, so as we look at, and then the final thing is on the EDL, uh, the, the idle $10,000 grants. Um, yeah, I think it's something that, you know, 
if you've already gotten your your loan forgiven and it's already been you know the, the outstanding balance was the ten thousand, you know that that is something that we're waiting a guidance on how that's going to be corrected. But you know, there's a couple of ways being speculated. One is the SBA knows uh, who's got all the the, the ten thousand dollar grants and offsets to the loan that they'll just fix that coming back through the bank, or the SBA could uh, go back to the banks and simply ask them to to, to execute a transaction to to uh, uh, re retire the remaining ten thousand uh, that might be left on a PPP note related to the yield grant. So it's just something we're going to have to keep an eye on and talk with our lenders uh, just to make sure we understand the mechanics and make sure that. Uh, if, if we did get our PTP forgiveness and it was offset that we get that corrected. Uh, so we're just gonna have to see what the logistics are as far as, as getting that done. Um, so, so now we're, we're kind of moving into the window of, yeah, everyone's big question. When is the window gonna open up? When can I submit my application? You know, as Chip said, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be waiting for step one, the SBA to release guidance. Uh, the SBA to release an updated uh, probably application form for the second round PPP loans. And then the banks will have to take that information, integrate it into their system. Uh, the SBA and the bank will have to make sure their portals are connected so they can actually submit the applications once the information is collected from the borrowers. So uh, anyone's guess on what that timing process will look like, uh, but, but it's going to be a very similar calculation to two and a half months or three and a half months of payroll uh, if you're if you're uh, NC or code 72, uh, so I think it's just a matter of getting all your information pulled back out, making sure it's 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 readily available. Again, you can include uh, employer paid health insurance, employer paid retirement benefits into that calculation to get your monthly payroll average. Uh, so so again, there is an option to collect the last 12 months or 2019 data. Again, for most people, that that 2000 19 data is going to be the one you're going to want to gravitate towards because if your revenue was down more than 25%, your payroll had to be down in most cases as well. So uh, for most, most people, it's going to be repeating that same 2019 uh, data collection process. Similar 941 uh, payroll reports in aggregating that information uh, so that you can uh, complete the application and get it turned back in. Uh, again, so as soon as some of these forms are released, it's going to be the same process of reaching out to your lender, uh, understanding if uh, when their portal or when, when they're going to accept the applications for loans, and then and then get that in as quickly as possible to uh, make sure you can fit in the uh, 284 billion that's been allocated to the program. So, Tom, a couple questions around that. Uh, the first is in terms of what people can do right now. I think what I heard you say is that they can prepare the calculation for the underlying basis, get the payroll information together. And secondly, they can pull the, the need calculation together, right? The 25% and they can, can be ready to mm -hmm. go. And that's about all we know for sure, right? There's, there's nothing else, there's no other specific authoritative guidance beyond those two things? No, not, not at this point. And I did see a number of questions asking, is it a calendar quarter? What if I wasn't in business, uh, you know, for the entire 2019? So, so there are some, uh, you, you do have to be in business by February 15, 2020. So if you started business after that, there doesn't appear, at least with the current guidance, that there's, there's a quarter to quarter calculation. But if you started in business in, in 2020 up to the 15th, or even the fourth or second quarter, uh, you know, there is guidance that, that will allow for you to do a comparison um, back to your first quarter in operation. But there, there are two or three additional clarifications in the guidance that kind of says, hey, if you started business at this point, here's your comparison period all the way through up until uh, February 15, uh, 2020. But there doesn't appear to be anything beyond February 15, 2020 uh, to, to fit into the uh, second round of PPP. So Tom, when we think about the period used for the basis, is the easy button just to say, if we had the PPP loan before, we can use the same information? Just rinse and repeat? In, in most cases, yes. Yeah. All right. 
a uh, couple other things, and some of these, you know, I think are probably going to be going to be great questions. We need more guidance of, but we talk with the 300 employees. Is that 300 heads? Is it 300 FTEs? Is it 300 W2s? And at what point in time do we do we make a count? Do we have any guidance around those things yet? No, I think that's going to be outlined in the updated application uh, when we get them on whether it's going to be an FTE calculation or just a point in time calculation, but but at this point, it, there, there's no reference in the guidance on a specific calculation. So I think we'll be waiting for the application to, to give us some details. There's been a fair amount of noise out there uh, from people saying you should get forgiveness as quick as you can from PPP 1.0. Other folks have said, don't get forgiveness. It's better not to. Does it matter? What are, what are we seeing right now? Well, I think, um, you know, again, there's a 10 month grace period from the end of your coverage period on your first PPP loan before there's any payments uh, to be made. So, I mean, you really, you know, if, you, if your coverage period ended in September, October, November of 2020, you know, 20, you know, that's really stretching all the way into August, you know, September is, you know, potentially July into next year. So, so there is some time to sort of let the dust settle and kind of see where all the guidance is coming out and, and uh, but there's no requirement, uh, you know, to get a PPP two loan, you, you know, there's the expectation that you, know, you will have spent the money or you, you know, and, and you expect forgiveness and, uh, but there's, but there's nothing that, that, that says you have to have uh, forgiveness on PPP one acknowledged prior to uh, filing for a PPP two loan uh, application. A lot, a lot of questions and confusion around the caps on PPP 2.0 as well. If a company got a million and a half dollars in the first round, are they limited to a half million dollars for a $2 million aggregated cap? Or is the $2 million cap not including the 1.5 million? Uh, the $2 million cap is just for the second round. so. Um, under your example, if they got a million five on the first round, uh, they, they could expect to get the same million five in the second round. The, the aggregation is on the total amount. So if you would have got four million dollars on your first round, uh, you would run into the cap of two million dollars on the second round. Great. There's a lot of additional questions that have come through. I think we're going to let Tom carry on um, with his presentation, and then once uh, once Tracy gets going on the tax side, uh, Tom and John, maybe you can hop in and try to hit uh, the 22 open questions that that still remain for you. Sure. All right. Jump jumping onto the next slide, uh, the economic injury disaster loan. Um, again, no 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 change to this program other than additional funding and the fact that it won't be an offset on forgiveness. So, you know, if, if it is a program that uh, you haven't participated in, uh, but now you're, you know, you're sitting and thinking, boy, you know, uh, maybe, a, maybe a low interest loan uh, could make some sense for my business, then, you know, the, the, the program did get additional funding and, and that might be something that, um, uh, that, that you could consider. So I haven't seen, you know, these, you know, these loans have been sort of capped at 150,000 each. Uh, I'm not, I haven't seen anything specific on whether this new funding amount will change, you know, that, that cap or, or the amount that you could potentially get. You know, this is a number that's moved all over the place. Uh, very early on, people were getting larger loans and then they were down to 10,000 and then they sort of got additional funding and, and leveled out at this $150,000 loan amount. So another thing we'll look for additional guidance to see is if that if that hundred fifty thousand dollar loan amount you know will change uh, with the additional funding available or not, and, and what the requirements would be potentially for that. Um, but that that program did get additional funding, and so that uh, that that will be an option again uh, if if you haven't already taken advantage of it. So move on to the next slide. John, I'm going to kick this back over to John to talk about a couple other things within this current bill that uh, um, may be helpful to you as well. All right, thanks, Tom. And I and I have been getting a couple of pings along the way on the uh, there's banks that are already reaching out to customers who have PPP loans with idle 
uh, advances as well. So I think the banks are starting to at least provide an understanding of who those customers are, and then uh, hopefully provide some sort of an avenue or a path to, to getting that fixed on their PPP forgiveness side for those that haven't already been closed out on their acceptance uh, for forgiveness yet. So uh, shuttered venue operator grants, again, I don't know that it's gonna be widely spread out there, but I'm sure there are many borrowers who are qualifiers of this. And it's like live venue operators, theater, promoters, uh, museums um, uh, are included in the zoos, public zoos. So anybody that might be in that qualifying area, there's $15 billion that was appropriated. Uh, it's going to be allocated by the SBA. It's not by banks. It's going to be a bit of a slow rollout. At, at least that's what we've been told. We're not exactly sure what that means. They said coming out in waves. Um, so a lot more guidance to come on that. The thing I caution you on is if you're a museum or a qualifier in this SBO a grant application and you're looking at getting an, a, a PPP, you can't do both. And so you might need to wait and see what this SBO grant looks like um, because it is, again, it's a grant, it's not a loan, similar to what the PPP can turn into, um, but you might need to figure out which one you can get more bang out of. And, um, and so stay tuned on that. Uh, Main Street Lending, really no big uh, uh, preclusion of using it in a second round. Uh, I would just say with some of the larger loans like we saw on PPP1, uh, the need question, necessity came up. And if you get a Main Street Lending funding, does that put you into a position that you're no longer needing funds in PPP? They didn't say anything about it, but we're just cautiously keeping an eye out for that one. I just, again, just caution, don't, don't jump out and try to get everything you can. Make sure you're doing it strategically and doing it at the right time. Next slide. I think we get over to the tax yeah. items with Tracy. So this will be a great spot for transition. Uh, as mentioned, uh, now that, that John and Tom are off the clock, if you will, they can, uh, they can hop into trying to, to key in some of the answers to the questions that we've got. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of good questions. Some of them are nuanced. I think the answers to many of them are, we're just gonna have to wait and see, see the SBA's official guidance on some of these things, but uh, you'll see that come along. And with that, Tracy, uh, we'll kick over to you. I know there's a lot in tax. Uh, I know some of the tax guidance also uh, impacts some opportunity to go back and get cash and get cash prospectively. So I think uh, you'll be as interesting or more as the guys were. And the 2021 phrase of the year is, Tracy, you're still on mute. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that vote of confidence, Chip. I will definitely try to be as interesting as I can be um, in this tax portion of the presentation. Um, there definitely was some good news uh, related to taxes in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Um, but with most of our tax legislation, we are still left with questions that need to be answered. And we'll be waiting for guidance from the IRS and from the states as we go forward. I'll try to point those situations out as we go. Um, today, there's two areas that I want to talk primarily about. One is the tax treatment of the PPP loans and the um, related funded expenses. And the other topic is the expansion of the employee retention tax credit. Um, if we have time, we will touch on a couple of other uh, just miscellaneous tax um, tidbits that were part of the um, CAA. Um, before I get started, I, I'm going to address one preliminary question that came in through the ex through um, the sign up, and that had to do with the work opportunity credit um, that was extended through 2025. Um, that's not part of today's presentation, but I saw the question, so I thought I would go ahead and answer that um, before we get started. So uh, we're going to begin by discussing the payroll um, protection program loans or the PPP loans. Uh, let's start with what we do know. We do know that the PPP loan proceeds will not be included in federal taxable income. In other words, the loan forgiveness will not be a taxable event. This was included in the CARES Act. The good news under the CAA is that we now have confirmation that the funded expenses will be deductible. And this treatment applies to federal income tax, 
state income tax is a separate state by state issue. The states have not really had a chance yet to react, react to CAA, so our information here is, is preliminary. Um, but I do wanna talk about three states where a lot of our clients have reporting requirements. In Florida, we have conformity with the Internal Revenue Code as it was on 1120, which was pre-CARES Act. What we mean by conformity is that Florida conforms with the IRS tax code um, up until the point of 1120. So, um, and that was before the CARES Act was passed, but it's taxable income for corporate tax purposes in Florida. It's possible that Florida could adjust their conformity date, or they could specifically adopt the provisions of the CARES or the CAA Acts, which would change that. Michigan has rolling conformity with the Internal Revenue Code. So where it stands right now, corporations and individuals will not be taxed on the forgiven PPP loans. We expect that funded expenses will be deductible in Michigan. However, there's always the possibility that Michigan could pass a statute that could change the tax treatment of the loan forgiveness and or the funded expenses. Ohio's conformity with the IRS is through 32720, which is the date that the CARES Act was passed. So Ohio conforms up through that point in time. This means that the PPP loan forgiveness will not be taxable for individual income tax or for the commercial activities tax. Um, we do expect that funded expenses will be deductible, um, but we need to make way for additional guidance from the state. Um, Raymond has a, a robust state and local tax team and they're proactively following the progress on this for, for all 50 states. And um, we're expecting to hear more from the states in the next probably 30 to 45 days. Tracy, I wanna, wanna highlight that for just a second. Uh, you know, we, we've spent so much time thinking about the federal income tax implications uh, for yep. states like Michigan with rolling conformity, boy, if all goes well, you know, this is, things are gonna line up pretty well, but, but there's some potential in other states to have some real disparity between federal taxable income and state taxable income. And really important that if you have activities in states uh, outside of the three we're talking about or, or outside of you know Michigan with the rolling conformity especially that you're you're thinking about that and talking about that because if your your state tax planning is based on your federal tax planning it could result in a, a big surprise yep 100 percent agree chip thank you um, I do want to take a couple minutes to talk about flow through entities and the basis issues that need to be considered in light of the tax treatment of the PPP loans and the funded expenses. And again, I would like to start with what we do know. Um, we now have confirmation that the PPP loan forgiveness will increase tax basis and the funded expenses will decrease tax basis. So basically it looks like at first blush um, that what we have is a wash um, unless we have a timing difference. So if the funded expenses are deductible in 2020, they will reduce basis in 2020. Um, if the forgiveness of debt income is not included in basis until 2021, then we could end up with a situation where our 2020 deductions are limited by basis and are therefore suspended. So the question in here is, when is the forgiveness of debt deemed to occur? Um, we have one economic transaction we have the, the forgiveness of debt and the related expenses. So our logic would tell us that the income and expense items would be pulled into the same period. Um, but the timing is not yet clear. We're, we're waiting for clarification and guidance on that. So if you had deductible expenses uh, funded by the PPP loan in 2020, but you don't have forgiveness of debt income until 2021, we could have a, we could have a, a timing issue there. Um, we also need to think about basis issues for S-Corps. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, nope, you're, you're good, Sam, go to the next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about how basis is allocated um, between buckets for S-Corporation purposes. Basically we have four buckets. 
um, we have our accumulated adjustments account or our AAA account. And this is where we record our undistributed S Corp earnings for post 1982 years. The second bucket is the shareholders undistributed taxable income previously taxed or PTEP account, which we rarely, we rarely hear about. It's, it's not as common for our clients to have, um, an, have a balance in this account, but this is where we hold pre 1983 S Corp earnings, which have not been taxed, which have been taxed, but not distributed. We have our accumulated earnings and profits account was where, which is where we accumulate our earnings and profits from our C Corp years. So this will only apply if your S corporation was originally a C corporation and had accumulated earnings and profits at the point in time that it made an S election. And then we have our other adjustments account. This is our adjustments. This is where we hold our adjustments for tax exempt income and related expenses. And it's also where we hold federal taxes attributable to a C Corp year. When you have an S corporation, when you have an S corporation with accumulated earnings and profits from C Corp years, the way that you allocate the basis to the various buckets will make a difference in how the distribution from the S corporation is treated for tax purposes in the hands of the shareholder. We don't have guidance yet on how the forgiveness of income and funded expenses will be allocated between the buckets. Um, where we could have an issue is if the forgiveness of income is allocated to the OAA account um, as tax exempt income, and then the funded expenses are allocated to the AAA account, thus driving down the balance in the AAA account. We just don't know yet um, how we're going to be expected to account for those. Um, will, the, will the funded expenses follow, the, uh, follow to the same bucket as the, the forgiveness of debt income, or will they be separated in two separate buckets? So to illustrate where we could have an issue, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the ordering of distributions for an S corporation. So distributions from an S corporation come first out of the AAA account, and they are not taxable to the shareholder unless they exceed the shareholder's basis in the corporation. However, distributions cannot bring the AAA account below zero. So once the AAA account is at zero distributions, then the distributions are allocated to the other buckets in the following order. First, they come out of the PTEP account, which again, it's tax-free to the extent that the shareholder has basis. And again, we, we don't see this very often. And next, they come out of the accumulated earnings and profits account. The issue that we have is that distributions that come out of the AEP account are treated as taxable dividends. Uh, once this account goes to zero, then distributions will come out of the OAA account, generally not taxable. So you can see if we have a situation where the funded expenses drive down the AAA account to the point where it's zero, distributions will then have to come out of the AEMP account as a taxable dividend. Um, if the um, forgiveness ends up in the OAA account, we have a mismatch there, you could end up with a taxable dividend that you weren't expecting. So if you have an S corporation, this is a really good time to ask yourself a couple questions. First, I would ask, does the upper S corporation have AEP from C Corp years? If you were an S Corp from the day that you became a corporation, if your election was effective the date that you were incorporated, then you don't have this problem. But if you started as a C Corp and then made an election to be an S corporation, then you need to look into this. So if you're in that situation, do you have accumulated earnings and profits from C Corp years? And if so, do you know how much that accumulated earnings and profits is? If we don't know the answer to that, then it might be a good time to do some analysis or do an earnings and profit study um, to, to get that information in place. Um, so we have some favorable updates on the taxability of the PPP loan funded expenses, um, but 
like everything else, we still have some unanswered questions um, that we, we will be waiting for guidance on um, from the IRS and from the states. And we will be keeping our clients posted on that as, as we find out more information. So, so Tracy, I think you know, we can summarize to say that it, it's generally good news about this deductibility. You know, this was, mm -hmm. this was a, the good thing. It does have some nuances. And so our, our uh, S corps and, and we need to take a look at and just make sure that, that we haven't gotten trapped a little bit uh, with some bad news coming with the good news. Does that seem like a, yes. a good upshot? Yep. Excellent. Yep. And so, yep. so you mentioned, um, you know, just in terms of, you know, what people should do, especially if they find themselves in this, this situation where they're, you know, they're not sure between their AAA and PTEP and mm -hmm. AED and all that, um, you know, that's part of the year in tax planning that we or any, any tax CPA will typically be able to help out with, right? They, you know, they're yes. not, they're not on their own. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's a good thing to reach out to your, your um, tax advisor on, and we can help with, um, with building that information. So, Fantastic. Yep. Um, we can go beyond that slide, Sam. Sorry. Um, so the other area of interest today is the employee retention tax credit. Um, there's a potential significant benefit um, for this credit. Um, this is a credit for retaining employees and continuing to pay compensation to them. The credit was put into play by the CARES Act, and then it was expanded on by the CAA. The CAA changes how the ERT, the C, blah, these letters are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the CAA changes to how the credit works are in effect for the first and second quarters of 2021, but they do not affect the calculation of the credit for the quarters in 2020, except for the fact that in 2020, PPP loan recipients are now eligible for the credit. Under the CARES Act, a PPP loan recipient was not eligible to take the ERTC credit. Tracy, let me delve into that for just a second. I think mm -hmm. everyone was, was always aware that this is a great change prospectively that going forward into 2021, you now could take advantage of the employee retention credit and the PPP. But what I think I hear uh, now is that there's an ability to retroactively go back. And if you were eligible for the employee retention credit for 2020 to go back and get a 2020 benefit as well as a 2021 benefit going forward. That is correct. That is correct. And we will talk in a little bit about, you know, the process uh, for going back and, and um, taking and um, claiming the credit. So we'll talk a very little bit about it because again, we're waiting for more guidance from the IRS on that. Um, so here's what's changed under the CAA. Eligible wages now include wages paid from March 13th, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Under the CARES Act, the credit was limited to wages paid through December 31st, 2020. Um, the definition of a small employer versus a large employer has changed. And again, this change is effective for 2021 only. So in 2020, a small employer is one who has up to 100 employees on average. A large employer would have greater than 100 employees. And in 2021, a small employer is one who has up to 500 employees on average, and a large employer would have more than 500. Um, and the big change um, that Chip is alluding to is the PPP loan recipients are now eligible for the, er for the um, ERTC credit retroactive back to 2020. So if you looked at this credit in 2020 and it didn't fit your situation, it's a good time to look at it again and see if you benefit under the expanded credit. You know, we've said that a couple of times, but I, I think it's worth repeating um, because there's, there's potential significant benefits there for the right taxpayers. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about the overview of the process 
And I've laid out three basic steps here. Don't be deceived by how simple this three-step process looks. There are a lot of underlying complexities. We won't be getting into all of those today, um, but, but I do wanna give you an overview. Um, so the first thing we do um, when we're looking at the credit is we determine if you're eligible for the credit and for what time frame are you eligible for the credit. Then we actually need to calculate it based on the qualified wages for the time frame that you're eligible. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you go about claiming the benefit. So an eligible employer is an employer who is carrying on a trade or business during the quarter and has met the business suspension condition or the gross receipts condition. The business suspension condition applies if a business is fully or partially suspended due to a governmental order issued in response to the coronavirus outbreak that limited commerce, travel, or the size of group meetings. So the, the, whether or not you have a governmental order is, is a black and white fact. Um, how it's applied to limiting commerce, travel, or the size of group meetings and how that affects your business it's a facts and circumstances situation. And it's a, it's a conversation you need to have with your business advisor to kind of ferret out um, if you're going to qualify under this condition. Um, if you don't qualify under the business suspension condition, you might qualify under the gross receipts condition. So it's, it's an or. It's the business suspension condition or the, or the government, I'm sorry, the government order condition, or it's the gross receipts condition. It's not both. And as you might expect, the gross receipts condition is defined differently for 21 and for 2020. Um, for 2020, eligibility begins with the quarter in which the employer experienced a significant decline in gross receipts. And here we're defining a decline as gross receipts being less than 50% of the gross receipts from the same calendar quarter in 2019. And the eligibility period ends on the first day of the first calendar quarter following the calendar quarter in which the employer's gross receipts were more than 80% of its gross receipts for the same calendar quarter in 2019. And I would love to get a job writing this verbiage um, and making it as complicated as it possibly can be. So here's, here's an example that I think will help clarify some of that uh, timeline. If in quarter two of 2020, your gross receipts were less than 50% of your 2019 quarter two gross receipts, you're going to qualify for the credit in quarter two. If then in quarter three, your gross receipts at some point during the quarter exceeded 80% of your 2019 gross receipts for the third quarter, you will still qualify for the third quarter, but the fourth quarter will not qualify unless you drop back below the 50%. So that was a lot of verbiage to, to, uh, to, to get to saying you would qualify under the second and third quarters and not the fourth. Um, for Trace, 20, Trace, go ahead. I'm sorry, Trace. I wanted to, to oh. hop back up to the, the first possible eligibility criteria. Yep. So firstly, as you mentioned, you know, for specific circumstances, please, uh, please reach out to your business advisor. But mm -hmm. let's talk uh, as an example, restaurants in Michigan. Restaurants mm -hmm. in Michigan um, certainly had a government order yep. shutting them down for a period of time. Are, yep. are they are they good to go? They qualify. That that's yes, black and I white. Would, yep, I would say so for the periods of time where the orders were in place. Yep. All right. So just as an example, that that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Um, so it's a governmental order. It can be county. I know in Florida, a lot of counties had different guidance. Mm -hmm. could be state or potentially could be federal. Right? It's any any governmental order. It's not not Correct. just federal. Okay. Correct. Yep. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay, so we're back to calculating the credit. Um, for 2021, the employer is eligible for a quarter 
if the employer's gross receipts for that quarter are less than 80% of its gross receipts for the same relative quarter in 2019. So when we're looking for at eligibility for 2020, we're comparing a 2020 quarter to a 2019 quarter, and we're looking for um, gross receipts less than 50%. When we're in 2021, we're comparing a 2021 quarter again to a 2019 qu quarter, but we only have to get to less than 80% of gross receipts for the same relative quarter. Um, there's, if the employer did not exist at the start of a 2019 calendar quarter, the comparison may be performed using the calendar quarter in 2020, that is the fourth calendar quarter after the quarter in 2019 that would have been used for the comparison. Simply said, if you'd had a business in 2019, um, and you were looking, you were looking at the first quarter of 2020, while well, you went, you were looking at the second quarter of 2020, then um, you would, I'm sorry, in 2021, you would look back at the second quarter of 2020, instead of the second quarter of 2019, because you weren't in existence then. Okay, so once we know we're eligible and we know what period we're eligible for, we can begin the process of calculating the credit based on qualified wages. And the calculation is different depending on how you, um, how you, how you became eligible. If you're eligible under the governmental order test, qualified wages are only through the period when fully or partially shut down. If you qualify under the gross receipts test, Qualified wages are through the end of the quarter in which the client's gross receipts have returned to more than 80% of what they were for the same quarter in 2019. So under the gross receipts test, it's a quarter by quarter qualification. Under the governmental order test, you may qualify for a portion of the quarter, um, depending on when the governmental order is lifted. A quick question. Yep. <clears throat> When we think about the uh, the 50% decline, the uh, our PPP loan proceeds considered gross receipts. When we think about gross receipts, mm. since they're they're not not considered income, are they excluded, or is it gross receipts before the CARES Act exclusion? Well, that's a good question, Chip. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nope. That's yeah, okay. Chip, I've been I've been hearing. Uh, there's a couple of people in different articles have said that 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 really is very unlikely that that would be considered gross receipts because it's it's not a means from business. It's a it's like getting a loan, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at it, it really doesn't make sense that it would be. But you're right, Tracy. Further guidance is coming. <laughs> um. Okay. So. Um, So we're gonna talk a little bit about qualified wages. <clears throat> qualified wages are paid, are wages that are paid while the employer fulfills either the business suspension condition or the gross receipts condition. And business suspension condition and governmental order uh, is fulfilled by the governmental order test. So those are kind of one and the same. I'm using those interchangeably. I, I don't want people to get confused, but when I talk about the business suspension condition, I'm talking about businesses that were suspended under a governmental order. Um, so if you're, again, if you're qualifying under the business suspension condition, you may, you may qualify for a portion of a quarter. Um, if you qualify under the gross receipts condition, you will qualify quarter by quarter. For small employers, um, wages paid to an employee regardless of whether or not the employer ceases providing services are eligible for the credit. For large employers, wages that qualify are wages that are paid, paid to an employee that is not providing services because the employer fulfilled either the business suspension or gross receipts condition. The wages paid when the employee is not performing services cannot exceed the amount that the employee would have been paid for working an equivalent duration 
in the 30 days before the period of not providing services. So in other words, um, if you have an employee who's not working um, because you, you, you've been shut down or you, you don't have the income to support them, um, if you're a large employer, um, the, the wages that you pay to that person um, are included as qualified wages, but you can't artificially bump up what you were paying them so that they're making more than they normally would have um, for that for the amount of time that they were working. Um, all right, so you can go to the next slide, Sam. Okay, a um, couple of things to take note of when calculating the credit. Qualified wages do not include wages funded by the PPP loan. And this is an area, again, where we're waiting for guidance from the IRS on how the mechanics of this are going to work. Um, so when we're looking back at 2020, um, we're going to have to somehow bifurcate the wages that were funded by the PPP loan from wages that weren't. Um, if you have not applied for forgiveness yet, then what you might want to do is differentiate between, you might want to use wages that were earned in a quarter when you didn't qualify for the employee retention tax credit, if that's possible. So it can be somewhat of a cumber, cumbersome, com, cumbersome calculation, um, but that would give you the, the most bang for your buck. If you were able to take the credit for wages in the, in the quarters that you qualified and then get the PPP loan, um, forgiven based on the quarters when you didn't qualify. Um, also, what does not qualify as wages for the credit are qualified leave wages required to be provided under the, the Family First Act. Qualified wages do include qualified health plan expenses of the employer that are expended to maintain a group health plan and are excluded from the employee's gross, in gross income under 106. So basically their, their health insurance premiums. So Tracy, let's, let's parse that out for just a second because I think it'd be yep. helpful for folks to understand. So let's say that we had a, a company and let's say that they had 99 employees that all earned $10,000 at least in 2020. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they got a PPP loan and that PPP loan had a period that ran from April 1st to June 1st mm -hmm. and uh, they were they used wages of three hundred thousand dollars to to apply for forgiveness mm -hmm. when we look at the employee retention credit mm -hmm. those those wages during that period that were used to qualify for get for forgiveness mm -hmm. those those do not qualify for the calculation for the employee retention tax credit Correct. But subsequent to that, and prior to that, after the CARES Act was enacted, those wages that are out there that were not used to qualify for, forgive, for forgiveness, subject to qualifying through all the other things, could be part of the calculation. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And I think we may have actually skipped a slide, which I think is my fault, um, which you're reminding of it. Keep going back, Sam. Um, because, yeah, this is the one, because there is a difference in how much you can claim for the credit in each of the years 20 and 21. In 2020, 50% of qualified wages up to $10,000 in wages for the year qualify for the credit. So that gives you a maximum credit of $5,000 per employee for 2020. In 2021, 70% of qualified wages, up to $10,000 in wages per quarter for a maximum of $14,000 per employee in 2021. So you can see the benefit is, is greatly expanded in 2021. Um, and if you, go ahead. I'm sorry, just, just to be super clear for everybody, 
Yeah. We, we call this an employee retention tax credit, but like any tax credit, it's kind of on an annual basis. So you could qualify, all things considered, for $5,000 ahead in 2020, and that'd be one tax credit. Yep. Which would be discrete from the 2021 cap of $14,000 ahead. In theory, between the two years, you'd be talking about a max of $19,000 ahead. You got everything it. Lined up right. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Thank you for helping clarify that. Okay, Sam, sorry. <laughs> um, switch back down. Okay. So, uh, one of the all important questions is how do we go about claiming the benefit for the credit? The credit is claimed on the employer's quarterly federal tax return. IRS Form 941, which most people are probably familiar with. Um, the employer, if they don't want to wait until their 941 return is filed to benefit, the employer has the option of retaining employment tax deposits to cover the credit. Um, for instance, under the CARES Act, the employer had the option of holding on to the employer's portion of Social Security and not remitting that to the IRS and then offsetting that against the credit calculated on the 941. Under CAA, the employer may hold back the employee and employer FICA, Social Security and Medicare, as well as the federal income tax withholding piece. So if you think you're gonna qualify for this credit um, under one of the two tests and that you'll be eligible, then you can hold on to some of your cash that you would be normally remitting as a tax deposit. And then at the end of the quarter, you true that up. And if there's any remaining credit, then you would get credit for that. Um, if your payroll tax deposits that you're withholding are not sufficient to cover the credit, then you may file form 7200 to request an advance payment on the credit. Um, it's important to note that in 2021, this option is not available to large employers. And for 2020, this option really, the, the timeline for filing the 7200 is really passed. So who would benefit from this would be small employers in 2021. So, um, and then the credit is trued up at the end of the quarter on the 941 form. So an example of this would be, um, for instance, if you if you qualify for we'll say $15,000 in credits and your withholdable taxes are only 10,000. So you're gonna hold on to that $10,000 in employment tax deposits. You could file the 7,200 form to get an advance payment of the additional $5,000 in credit that you think is owed to you. And then the credit is trued up on the 941 form so that if you didn't get all of your credit, you would get it at that point in time. Um, now, in terms of claiming the benefit for 2020, um, this is gonna be retroactive because we've already gone past the point in time where you can withhold your payroll taxes and where you can file the 7200. Um, the IRS is still coming out with the guidance about how we're going to claim that credit retroactively um, intuitively, what would make sense would be to be able to claim that credit on the fourth quarter 941 return or an amended fourth quarter 941 return. If you are going to qualify for the credit and you haven't filed your fourth quarter 941 report yet, you might want to hold off on that. Um, otherwise, the option will most likely be to amend the 941 form. Um, we hope that it would be a matter of amending the fourth quarter 941 form to catch all three quarters in play, um, but we don't we don't know that for sure. So we're still waiting, still waiting for guidance. Um, your the favorite phrase for this webinar. Um, for the 2020 credit, you do have an opportunity for immediate cash benefit um, by retaining the employment tax deposits. So you can reduce what you're paying in. Um, you can withhold some of the employer, employer employee FICA, as well as the federal income tax withholding. And um, if that's not enough to cover your credit, you can file Form 7200 if it's applicable, again, available only to small employers in 2021. 
um, or you can wait until the end of the quarter and file form 941 um, to get that back. Now, um, in terms of retaining the employment taxes, in order to retain the employment taxes, you really need to know that you qualify for the credit, either under the governmental order test or the gross receipts test. So you're gonna to have to have an idea that you qualify. The total amount of retained employment taxes must be equal to or less than the total amount of the refunded payroll tax credits. And, and there's really, um, there's a couple of them in play. There's the refunded payroll tax credit for providing qualified sick leave payments, the payroll tax credit for increasing research activities, and then in, of course the ERTC, which we're talking about now. So in order to um, withhold, to hold back that withholding or to file the 7200, you need to have a you need to have a sense that you qualify for the credit and you need to have an understanding of what that credit might be. Um, if you if you erroneously withhold or are refunded additional amounts from the 7200 above and beyond the credit, then that will be treated as an underpayment of the employer portion of social security tax for assessment and collection purposes. So you could be subject to penalties if you file that 7200 and apply for a refund that you receive, um, but the refund exceeds what your allowable credit is, then you could be subject to, to some payroll penalties. So Tracy, yep. just to take a break for a second, there's a ton of questions coming through around the ER TC. We'll, we'll, we'll hit all those in the, uh, in the mm -hmm. Q&A section. But I wanna talk about you know action items, because I think what we're yep. seeing on the chat is reflective of this is a big deal. It's a big deal right now for payroll taxes that, boy, for Friday's payroll could be could be not paid in. And it's maybe a big deal retroactively, yep. um, either getting a nice chunk of credit that'll go forward a while, or maybe even some cash back, still waiting to hear from that. So this is something that I think anybody with payroll needs to be stepping up and listening to and mm -hmm. now needs to do something. And that, that's something, we don't have all of the guidance, but that right. something can be starting to determine quarter by quarter when they qualify and when they don't. Yep. It can be starting to figure out what the basis, the underlying employment wage basis is for yep. each of those quarters. And then also can starting to be looking at the, you know, when they, they use payroll to qualify for forgiveness to, to start to do those calculations, right? All of that can happen right now. And if folks need help, they can bury their tax advisors with questions, right? <laughs> yep, we're looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. We're ready and waiting for those questions. But I, I agree. I think now is the time to start thinking about those things and, and, and queuing it up. It's kind of like what you talked about with the, the second round of PPP loans. Um, we, we're not ready yet to file those applications, but we can start queuing up our numbers, figuring out what our questions are, and uh, working through working through the gray areas and, and watching out for more guidance. So now is definitely the time to do that. Great, thanks. I, I had a, a hunch you'd be more exciting than the guys, and, and you certainly delivered, well, so thank you, you very know. much. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, gonna hop into the question and answer section. And in the background, uh, there's been 62 questions answered, uh, 21 still open. Before we get there though, I wondered if any of the panelists wanna say a couple of words either about frequently asked questions or, or cover some of these things. So I'll give you each a chance to, to just chat for a minute about anything else you, you think we can't live without knowing. And then we'll try to work our way through the questions as time allows. John, you wanna, wanna lead off? I'm sure you've got something to say. Well, my head is spinning from trying to keep up with questions, um, but I will tell you that there's, there's one question that continually is coming up and I think I've addressed it, but not, not in case everybody hasn't seen it. The, the big question is, all right, so I didn't do a, an ERTC law, um, credit before because I did the PPP. Now we can use them both, it's retroactive. 
how do I how do I tell what wages I use for the PPP and what wages qualify for the RTC, all those kind of things. And and we now we do know that you can go back. I mean, it's very specific. You can go back. But what we don't know is how how are the wages going to be allocated? How are they going to be split? Do you have to first go up to the 60 percent? Or if you have 60 or if you have 80 percent wages to 20 percent other qualifying costs, do you have to use that proportion? We really just don't know, but I can tell you that the question's been asked um, many times, not just on this uh, conference call, but um, across the board in various articles. So SBA needs to provide guidance. And our hope would be that it's gonna be some sort of a mathematical calculation allocation, and they'll provide guidance on that. So you can go back and do it. Now, the, other, the second question is how do I do it? Again, we don't know. Forms haven't been issued yet, policies, procedures, uh, steps haven't been uh, disclosed yet. So um, kind of hold on for now on the how to get it done. But if you can pull together, as Tom was saying early on, pull together at least your data so that when they give you the opportunity to run the numbers, you know what numbers to put in what blank spots. Great, thanks, John. Tom, we'll, uh, we'll rotate over to you. I know you've been popping through a bunch of questions. What, uh, what's the frequently asked issues? Well, I think uh, a couple that were recurring. One is the definition of the quarter, you know, I've had a number of people ask, is it just a calendar quarter? Um, you know, in the bill, there's various mentions of calendar quarter, but in the specific language for the revenue test, it just, it says quarter. Um, the way it's written, it kind of implies calendar quarter, but until we get further guidance, I think that's what at least it appears to be, is it's, it's, a, cal it's a calendar quarter, uh, does, doesn't seem to give the flexibility just to pick any three random months and define that as your quarter. Uh, so we'll have to wait for more guidance to see if there's any flexibility there, but that's what that appears is just a calendar quarter at this point. Uh, the other big question I had was, you know, is, hey, I got loan forgiveness, is that part of revenue? You know, in, 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 am I gonna record that as part of my revenue test? Because, you know, without it, I, I, I'm 35%, you know, drop in revenue, but if I have to count it as revenue, then it puts me under that 25% threshold. You know, again, there's not specific guidance that you know uh, addresses that specifically, but 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 I think our, our 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 current feeling is that loan forgiveness is coming through as other income, and it's not it's not generally flowing into the revenue line. Uh, you know, the, the the bill calls for gross receipts, uh, so so I, I don't think there's a scenario where that loan forgiveness would fit into a gross re receipt definition. Uh, I mean, it's something we'll keep an eye on, but I think our, our position now is that it's, it's a gross receipt revenue comparison. Uh, throwing the forgiveness in there would be an apple and an orange. Yeah, and I would also add, Tom, a lot of questions is what is what's included in gross receipts? Is it interest and dividends? Is it? I think a lot of that has to be defined. Um, and certainly if you're a bank, interest and dividends is definitely going to be gross receipts. So I think it depends on your business and, and whether or not they narrow that scope to an operations based type of a calculation, then I think it's going to be much more like you're talking about it's business receipts and it probably won't include mm -hmm. capital gains, for example, or other things, but you never know. Right. Great. Tracy, I'm going to give you another minute to catch your breath and hop over to Shannon quick. Okay. We haven't touched on the HR world uh, much today, but I did want to give you the chance to to let us know if there's if there's anything that's come to mind for you along the way that you think we should uh, should take a second to talk about. Oh, there you Is go. that for me or Tracy? For, for you, Shannon. Okay, sorry. Um, the FFCRA benefits was the least basically changed in this new bill. Um, the emergency paid sick leave benefits, they expired as of 12-31-2020. Um, and the same with the emergency FMLA, they as well are no longer mandatory after 12-31-2020. The only difference is, is that they allow the tax credits if employers choose to provide those to their employees. It doesn't mean that the benefits reset, they get additional time. It's still the same amount of time, the 80 hours for the emergency paid sick leave or the, up to the 12 weeks of the emergency paid family, I'm sorry, the emergency family medical leave. It's just that if an employer chooses to honor those, they can still get the dollar for dollar tax credit through either their payroll deductions and or through the quarter and 941s 
through the end of first quarter, 331 right now is the deadline. The only thing I, you know, caution is that, you know, we might get more um, guidelines from the Department of Labor, though, for employers on right now, you can pick and choose as employers whether you want to offer just the EPSL or the EFMLA if you choose to continue those credits through the end of the quarter. It's just that the Department of Labor may come out and say that it's all or nothing either or way, but we're just still kind of waiting for more clarification from the DOL on that. That's pretty much it. Great. Thanks, Shannon. All right, Trace, we've given you a chance to catch your breath. Have you thought of anything else or seen anything else that has come across the, the chat that you want to hit in the, 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 the general yeah. session? All yeah, right. I, I kind of skimmed through, and the, there are a couple of things I want to hit on. Somebody had asked about under the um, PPP loan forgiveness, funded expenses, treatment, conformity, um, why we were talking about Florida when they don't have an income tax. And I think what they're referring to is the fact that individuals don't have an income tax, but there is a corporate income tax. So that information regarding conformity would relate to the corporate income tax. Um, if they have additional questions on that, they, they can reach out and uh, we can give some more explanation. Um, the other things that I saw a lot of questions on and hopefully I can answer them. One is the, the um, calculation of the qualified wages and what the limitations are. So for, um, and it is confusing because there's a wage limitation and then you take a percentage of that. So for 2020, we're looking at 50% of the wages, but you're limited to 10,000 in wages. So, and it's based on an annual um, 10,000 wages. So your credit for 2020 is limited to $5,000 or $10,000 of 2020 annual wages times 50%, which gets you to 5,000. For 2021, the credit is equal to 70% of the qualified wages paid to an employee based on a quarterly limit of $10,000 in wages. So for each quarter, you can take the $10,000 of wages, multiply that by 70%, and you get a $7,000 per credit. Because this is only available for the first two quarters, you get a maximum of a $14,000 credit for 21. So I apologize. I, I kind of skipped over that slide and then gone back to it. I, I hope that that clarifies it a little bit. And then the other place I saw a lot of uh, several questions had to do with the logistics of um, going back and claiming the um, credit for 2020. And uh, maybe those were put in there before we talked about it, but we, we still are waiting some guidance on how to do that. Our expectation is that it will be trued up on a fourth quarter 941, either an originally filed or an amended fourth quarter 941, but we don't know that for sure. Um, hopefully they won't make us go back and calculate it um, on each quarterly 941 report for the second and third quarters. Um, so I think that probably captured uh, most of what I saw from, from my part of the presentation. Great. All right. So I'm going to talk about a couple of housekeeping things, and then we'll take the rest of the time we have to run through questions. So firstly, as mentioned before, the presentation is going to be out on the Raymond YouTube channel. If you need to go back and listen to something again, take notes, whatnot. Um, we do have the questions uh, recorded. And for the people uh, whose questions we don't get to, who left us contact information, we're going to work really hard to get back um, to you with the answers to your particular question. For the anonymous attendees who've asked questions that will be more challenging, uh, I guess for those folks, stay tuned to further, uh, further productions if we don't get to your questions today. Um, and with that, I uh, do want to thank all the attendees and presenters, and we'll get to as many questions here as we can along the way. And so panelists, um, go ahead and jump in if you can. One of the questions is, is the change to the 401k loan limit still good to borrow $100,000 during 2021 that was in place in 2020? We haven't talked about that. That's a little bit um, outside of what we've been focused on. I don't know, Shannon, if you have any, any intel on that. I, I don't recall that I've seen whether that was extended under the new act. I have not seen anything on it. 
All right. I haven't Let's... seen anything on it either. That doesn't mean it's not there and I didn't miss it, but mm -hmm. I don't recall seeing that. Okay. As we talk about this, uh, this business partially shut down as a result of a government order, there's a lot of questions around, you know, what does that mean? And I think that the overall thing is um, between your, your tax advisor and your legal advisor, we probably have to look at the particular government order and your particular fact pattern. Some of the easy ones are things like restaurants where they were mm -hmm. just shut down. What, what is harder is if your, your business is going out to uh, some other business's location, mm -hmm. but that business is closed and you can't get there because they were closed by a government order. Does that mean you're shut down too? And there, there's a lot of things like that that are really going to be dependent on facts and circumstances. And you know, what, is, what does it mean if, we, if, our, if our offices is shut down, but we can work at home? Mm -hmm. where we shut down, you know, and so there's, there's going to be some further definitions to come out around that. Um, but ultimately, you know, when you get to some of those things that are not so black and white, we are going to have to do a little bit of work to look at the particular government orders we have to rely on. And by the way, um, there may be more than what, what you immediately think of. I know in the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, we, we kind of default to the, the state orders, but there's been a lot of okay. orders issued by counties, um, different things. So, so there may be some coverage there. Um, so good question to ask about. Um, <clears throat> another question that's come out is around, I think, segregation. If we have multiple locations and one of them is around 100 people, can, can you look at the ERTC for just a location? Is it aggregated in the same way that um, the, the PPP loan was across commonly owned entities. Have we seen anything around how, how they're looking at that? So, so if you have a, a, you know, a parent that owns five businesses, mm -hmm. are those five businesses aggregated or is each EIN discrete if they have less than 100 okay. FTEs? Um, you know, honestly, Chip, I know there, there is some information there about aggregation. I don't have that at the tip of my sure. tongue. But we can follow up on that. Great. Um, let's see. Again, a lot of things around the uh, the shutdowns, and so we'll you know we kind of covered those in general. And I think the the answer to all of those is we've got to take a look a little bit. Um, one of the issues that's that's come up a lot already outside of this call has been what about your if you if your payroll is done by a payroll company and they just have a 941 on autopilot. Um, they don't have all the information needed to do everything that we're talking about. Uh, and so we're going to have to have some coordination between the tax folks and the payroll folks. So if payroll's done, if it's outsourced, um, you know, that's going to be a, a team effort, I think. And I think maybe the thing to do for 2021 is to make sure that your, your payroll provider uh, gets connected with your tax advisor quickly, because that fourth quarter 941 could be a chance to save some cash. You know, right mm -hmm. now, rather than just letting it fly in autopilot. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of there's a, a fair amount of uh, of interesting questions that are going to be nuanced about you know what about sole proprietors, what about leased employees, subcontractors, and things like that. And I think you know those are all questions that in the first PP were answered in FAQs. And you know we know what the first PPP talked about. We don't really know yet what, what's going to happen yet. So I think that's a stay tuned type thing. Um, Jerry Kriegel's asking, and this might be for you, Shannon. Uh, in 2020, employers were allowed to defer the employer portion of the Social Security tax until a later date. It, was that extended for 2021? Is that a one and done? What do we know about that? All I know, right? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Sir. Are you referring to the FFCRA, the employee tax credits off a of payroll? The deferral program. Yeah. All I know is it's extended till 331. Right now, that's all that's in writing. We're probably waiting for more clarification on that. If they can apply it at a later date. Fair enough. Uh, Tom, how about 501C7s? Are they eligible for PPP round two? I saw C6. I don't know if I saw C7s. You know, I, I only saw six referenced in, in the bill. Um, I, I don't recall seeing seven. 
Very good. Um, we did get uh, one of our retirement plan specialists, Chad Rick, uh, has given us a definitive answer regarding the uh, the 401k. Uh, it was not extended into 2021. That was a one and done in 2020 at this point. Uh, in, in terms of recommendations, we did say it a couple times. I think it's worth saying again, though, regarding the ERT, if we haven't filed the fourth quarter 941 uh, and we think we're going to be eligible for the tax credits, we're recommending that we hold off and, and get going quickly on trying to figure out whether we're eligible and doing those calculations. Yeah. All right. Continuing to work our way through the questions here. Um, Tracy, you talked about a couple of, of employer credits, I think. Uh, yeah, there, there um, is an employer, there's a um, credit for um, research and development. That was one of the credits that actually, there's three credits that can be claimed on the 941. And one of them is the um, employee retention tax credit, which we spent most of our time talking about. There's also a payroll tax credit for increasing research activities. And then there's the FFCRA refundable payroll tax credit for, for providing qualified sick leave. So when you're looking at um, you know, the 7,200 advanced payment form, um, you, know, you can look at those three credits, um, but you can't exceed what those three credits would total to. Gotcha. And those are all three reported on the 941. Great question. I'm not sure the answer to. Um, Laura notes she understands we can't use the same wages for forgiveness in the PPP and the EIDL, and we can't go between the PPP and the ERTC. How about wages funded by the EIDL? Do those still qualify for the ERTC or do those have to be backed out as well? I've seen things on the, the, the FFR, the Family First credits not being able to be double dipped. I don't know that I've seen anything on the EIDL specifically. Uh, Chip, I just, I just saw something the other day that, um, and again, I don't know this if this is uh, in the statute or not, but at least this article seemed to indicate that there's no way to use the same wages for any of the loan, PPP loan, or the paid leave credits, or the ERTC. It, it's like you can you can use the wages one time, but not again for the for a different benefit. Yeah, and for each of those acronyms, I'm right on board with you. I don't know if mm -hmm. I've seen the EIDL. I haven't seen different. that in conjunction. No, and I, I that's the one thing I was just going to say is I don't think I've seen them apply the EIDL in that context. Yet, that, so it that would being make, said, yeah, for the guidance. <laughs> great. Chip, Chip, I think the other thing is the, the IDL probably has got the broadest use of funds. So mm -hmm. I, I think just just by the definition of use of funds, there's a lot of things you can use, you know, the funds for on the uh, EIDL program that you know you could you could steer away from wages. So true. True. That's, and, and the, that's the planning opportunity, right? To be able to look at your wages, look at the value of each of the credits, and then try to pick it apart. We will need a little bit more guidance to figure out uh, what and how to do those calculations, but what a planning opportunity that is. Yeah, and I think that's probably the note that I want to end on here is that when you think about PPP around one and two and forgiveness and now the ERTC and maybe EIDL, you know, there's ways to maximize using all of those programs. Mm -hmm. There's ways to minimize using all those programs too. And you wanna try hard to take and get the biggest bang for your buck out of all of these things. There's a lot of power in these programs if you qualify. And so, you know, I think that the biggest takeaway here is this stimulus package is gonna inject some money out there. And if you're thinking you could be qualifying for any of the things we've talked about, uh, it's, it's time right now to get ready. The, Employee retention credit is live. That, that's something mm -hmm. on a prospective basis. It's there right now. If you have payroll being paid this Friday, it could impact your cash by keeping you from having to pay the employer part of payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is time to get ready for. And if we plan it out, um, just as, as Tom mentioned, we can use these funds for different things that don't 
helps cancel each other out along the way. So great discussion, great questions. Um, I'm really happy for how the presentation went for all of the, uh, the questions that came in and comments. Really appreciate everybody's time. Hopefully it was super valuable. Uh, you will see some more information that comes out of here. We'll try to get back to people who we didn't, uh, we didn't get to their questions or they were very specific. And as always, feel free to reach out directly to your Raymond advisor with, uh, with very specific questions. So team, thanks so much. Uh, guests and participants, thanks so much and have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday.